Hey there, friends. I just uh, returned from Mercado. This is a place on Foster here in Portland. It's a less developed quarter of the city. Not so fancy, not so like wealth endowed, you could say. It's kind of old style Portland. What I want to talk about, however, is not geography, but philosophy. This is Philosophical Investigations. This is the hardcover version that I have on loan. And here's the very often seen soft cover, or the blue one, right? I first picked this up and started reading it in my college years at Princeton University. I was intrigued by philosophy. As a kid, though, I was more interested in psychoanalysis. I was kind of like an Adam Curt Curtis movie in terms of my outlook. I was interested in Freud. I was interested in advertising. I didn't see advertising as especially evil, partly because in Rome, the best TV was Carousello, which was on around, what was it, 9 o'clock? And it was all ads, all commercials. The rest of the television was pretty much commercial free, as I recall, in those days. And they would bunch the ads in one show and they were great ads they were like two minutes long each or so and each one would tell a story and you never knew what they were advertising that wasn't the point it was more like let's give companies an opportunity to sh share video shorts kind of like youtubes in the old days before the internet right this was back in the um the 1960s I left Italy in the 70s. I went to Junior English School of Rome for a few, uh, actually just just for the third grade. We call it first form. And then I switched over to fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade at Overseas School of Rome. Anyway, just a little bit of biography. I have Wittgenstein text on the screen now. This is a rather arcane philosophy. It's very famous. If you do any philosophy at the university, chances are you're going to read some of this. But what is it? What is it? It's the kind of philosophy where someone's trying to talk you out of a way you see things habitually that you don't even realize that you see things that way. So it's double hard to talk someone out of uh, a perception that they don't even know they have. But he opens the book, Philosophical Investigations, pointing to what he considers the view he's trying to talk you out of, which is that the meaning of any given word is somewhat simplified, but in general is just some thing out there, and the word kind of like points to it. And uh, I've got some water on my glasses. There was some uh, rain coming back, but nothing too serious. I had books on the back of the bicycle. I didn't want them to get wet either. So, Anyway, when you say the word consciousness, for example, like I'm going to read a passage here in a sec. Are you pointing to some private thing that you know consciousness means? Like are you pointing like with an arrow into some private space somewhere and saying, okay, this is what consciousness means. You would close your eyes and like focus in and go, okay, this is the meaning of consciousness. Just like you might stare at the, at the color red, which I have around me here, and just say, okay, that's the meaning of the word red. You kind of point to the color in your mind. How is it that you're pointing to the color? You're just making your attention focus somehow on the color red, and then you say, well, that's what I mean by red. So it's what we call a private ostensive definition. Okay, let's get to that passage. He's trying to talk us out of all that, which is so deeply ingrained, it's almost impossible. And he kind of despaired of being able to do it. In his introduction, he said, this book is not for anybody I know, basically. The future, he's kicking it forward, time capsule. Maybe down the, down the road, people will start to see what I'm talking about. I think one of the mental tricks you can do to help is imagine that language is like this shared machine that we all use, we all talk with it, but it kind of talks through us. It says I, it says we, but it's not sentient. And so when you hear language as one 
being but not a sentient one talking with great knowledge about all this stuff it's had no experience of but it comes through our mouths and you know we get things done we get work done with by allowing this non-sentient being to to work its magic through our vocal cords and through what we write and everything language is pervading the universe you could say our universe of discourse it is almost co-determinant with that but it has no experience itself and yet we do but who are we in this picture right it's kind of i'm trying to get you to see a kind of a mental trick you could pull on yourself to kind of start to back away from the idea that the way words mean is by pointing to anything in experience we have experience we do and uh, words have meaning but where do this does this meaning come from and Wittgenstein's whole thing was the words come from meaning comes from how we use tools the words being tools like screwdrivers they're things that we it's the games that we play with them that gives them their meaning not any private experience that you personally have which isn't to discount the value of your private personal experience in any way a lot of people get confused about Wittgenstein because they say he's denying subjectivity or he's a behaviorist most of those myths have been set to rest by now it's fortunate that we're in 2019 and a lot of wrong views about Wittgenstein have been dispelled already. I don't have to do that work. So let's see. Where's that passage? Here's a good one. It's 97. Funny, I went in through the index on, on these books. Like when I look up the word table, let's try it on this index just as a, as a fun exercise. The passage I want to read is 97. But when I look up 97, ST table, uh, do I see 97 listed? No. Maybe because nine, because the word table is in quotes, but I don't see that there either. So I feel like one of the most important passages that I would like to find using the word table or the word lamp, it doesn't actually go to 97. So I would say this index needs to be updated, folks. Look at that table. Nothing, 97. All right, so 97, all his passages are numbered, kind of like Bucky does in Synergetics. It's normal to number passages. It's not pretentious. I've said that before. Makes them easy to retrieve. And Fuller, kind of like, I mean, Wittgenstein, similar to Fuller. I think they're both, both works lend themselves to hypertext treatment. In other words, the order in which you put these together, these number passages, the sequence is not that important because the linear uh, sequence, although inevitably we have a linear sequence, it's the hypertext that it's the, it's the total picture that's going to, the, the insights might come from reading it in various orders. Same with synergetics. Synergetics has several entry points, like they're called scenarios. There's some place where actually you you can start in different places, like you're given some guidance in that turn, in that sense. All right, and Wittgenstein himself says about his work that also rearrangement is possible. So these thinkers were anticipating hypertext, the way I think of it. They knew it was coming at some intuitive level. Hypertext meaning as we literally implement it as HTTP protocol on the internet, but you know, it's also the way you think as a humanities scholar, like a Hugh Kenner type, you uh, have a hypertext kind of mentality. And the way I talk is somewhat hypertexty. I jump around. Okay, so here's the passage. Thought is surrounded by a halo, its essence, logic, present, present. Okay, I'm going to start over. Thought is surrounded by a halo. Its essence, logic, presents an order. In fact, the a priori order of the world, that is, the order of possibilities, which must be common to both world and thought. But this order, it seems, must be utterly simple. It is prior to experience, must run through all experience. No empirical cloudiness or uncertainty can be allowed to affect it. It must rather be the purest crystal. But this crystal does not appear as an abstraction, but as something concrete. Indeed, as the most concrete, 
as it were, the hardest thing there is. And then he gives a reference to his own work. Because as you'll find if you read the Wittgenstein literature, I have like 40 books on loan about Wittgenstein. You'll find that we, uh, and he tells us that his later philosophy is in a way a critique of his first philosophy. Like he more than most probably was kind of pulled in by what he later tries to talk us out of. He's the paradigm guinea pig for his own um, awakening, enlightenment. And then this next paragraph, we are under the illusion that what is peculiar, profound, essential in our investigation resides in its trying to grasp the incomparable essence of language. That is the order existing between the concepts of proposition, word, proof, truth, experience, and so on. This order is a super order between, so to speak, super concepts. Whereas, of course, if the words language, experience, world have a use, it must be uh, as humble a one as that of the words table, lamp, door. So he's like, hey, consciousness, don't imagine that you're suddenly in deep waters compared to like when you're talking about doors or tables. It's like it's just a word. And you may think, well, but it points to something deep. And you kind of close your eyes and you go, this is what consciousness means. Um, but we don't do that so much in Wittgenstein. We realize that consciousness is like a public tool. We share it. It's got a lot of language games around it. A lot of them are medical. Like, you know, if you've had a concussion, they want to know if you're unconscious or how conscious are you. They'll shine a light in your eyes and ask you questions. They may not really care what your answers are as long as you're kind of tracking the light as they move it back and forth. There's lots of different ways we use the word consciousness. And you can try to introspect and get the meaning in a flash from something in your personal experience. But if you do it that way, you're not really trying to get talked. You're not trying to let Wittgenstein talk you out of what he's trying to do. It's like the more you close your eyes and realize the meanings through private experience, the less you are working to get free of the superstitious nonsense, really, that Wittgenstein hopes he can talk you out of. Now, it's an uphill battle for him. It's very much based on perception, trying to induce different perception different way of looking like when you see a duck and then you notice it's really a rabbit those pictures those tricky pictures where you see them one way and then boom you see them another way well we see whole of our our reality can be uh changed by these kinds of sudden enlightenment experiences where you see things different differently and philosophical investigations is largely a bold attempt to try to induce enlightenment in the sense of different apperceptions, different, um, like a Necker cube, another example. I, I relate that to Wittgenstein. I relate Wittgenstein's um, approach to synergetics in that I think uh, the unit volume tetrahedron we try to... Uh, give meaning to also comes with its own duck rabbit kind of experience in terms of how can we have a unit volume tetrahedron with edges one philosophy of mathematics could take that up there okay so i'm going to talk about wittgenstein more in future videos it's not all about buckminster fuller although i do relate the two um school of tomorrow which i'm working on may or may not get into the Wittgenstein stuff. I haven't decided yet, but definitely the YouTubes are going to do that and have already. So go back and look for Duck Rabbit. See what you can find. All right. Talk to you soon.